Amen. Okay, it is time to begin worship and the word today. I have a word from the Lord for this afternoon that I believe, I hope, will be a great encouragement and a blessing to you. So I hope you'll stay tuned with us for the entire service. Uh, people will be joining as the service is in progress. That is to be expected. It happens in real life, too. So people come in as the service is going on. So uh, you can imagine it also happens in uh, when we're broadcasting online. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer at this time as we begin our service. I continue to ask you to remember Tommy and I in prayer at this time. He is still out of work. We are coming up in a couple of weeks on one year that he will have been out of work and it is creating enormous hardship and difficulty for us and uh, it only get worse from here so we really need you to help keep us in prayer and uh, as I've said many times before Tommy is our primary uh, earner in this household and therefore we're accepting this situation is a sign from the Lord that we may have to move our ministry elsewhere. And what we're doing is we're believing God to open up a position for Him somewhere where there will be a community who is willing to hear our message, receive our message, support our message, and who want to be part of the church that God has given me a vision to build. Amen. And uh, I am not interested in building a kingdom for myself. That's why you don't see my name on our ministry. Uh, we don't call it, you know, My Name Ministries, as you see with such big names uh, in television ministry today, Kenneth Copeland Ministries and uh, Jimmy Swagger Ministries and all this. I have never been comfortable with that notion. Uh, I don't believe in uh, preachers doing that. That's why when I started my ministry, my affirming ministry, back in 1993, we began with the, the uh, name Grace Oasis Ministries. Amen. And uh, Grace Oasis Ministry still continues to be our umbrella ministry name. That's why we refer to the church as Grace Oasis. <coughs> but in 2008, we changed the name of the church to the One Church in Christ Jesus. We shortened it to simply the One Church. And the reason we did that, the whole logic behind that was that it would be a very easy name to remember. That people, when they saw the name, the one church, they would easily remember it. What I did not anticipate was the ignorance and stupidity of people and how they would see that name. And next thing you know, we were being accused of uh, you think you're the only church. And I said, no, the name of the church is not the only church. It's the one church. And if you looked at the scripture we provided in support of that name, it is the scripture in which the Apostle Paul declares, um, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek bond nor free, male nor female, but ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So the concept behind the one church was simply that God's church is one. It is not divided by race, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identification, or any other divisive uh, issue. All of God's people are one church. That's what we meant by the name. But of course there were all kinds of people out there who mistook and misunderstood our name. We have a new name that we'll be unveiling for our new uh, 
leg of our ministry as soon as we know what direction we'll be going in. I'm very excited about the new name that we've chosen. I think it'll be a very positive, I hope. I'm sure somebody out there will find fault with it because people find fault with everything. But, uh, but hopefully it'll help us to do the work we're trying to do. Amen. You know, folks need to understand. Uh, I'm going to share this with you. It's a little intimate detail. But Tommy and I, Dallas is the area that he grew up in. Okay, And I've been very uh, plain spoken about the fact that Tommy grew up in a, a pseudo-Christian cult. And uh, his parents, bless their hearts, are lovely people but they're still deeply involved in this cult. And for that reason, we have been um, limited in how we can advertise locally, how we can promote the church locally, and it's created a lot of limitations on us. Um, so when I complain about, and I, I admit, whether it's right or wrong, I confess that at times I've complained about the lack of support and the lack of response in the city of Dallas. When I talk about these things, a lot of times some of the fault for that may lie in the fact that we are extremely limited in how we can advertise and promote our church um, it could create massive problems for Tommy. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but it could create a lot of very serious problems for him. So we're hoping that wherever the Lord sends us, it'll be a place that is far enough away so we can easily, openly advertise and promote uh, in newspapers and publications and television, whatever we have to do. Um, without being concerned about it creating a problem for he and his family. So anyway, be in prayer for us. We are trusting the Lord to direct our bark to a place where the community will be responsive. Folks, I've talked about it before, and I'm going to talk about it again. The Word of God says that as the preacher of the gospel goes forth, Jesus said this, nobody else, Jesus. He said, if the town, the city you go into does not receive you, the term receive there, if you investigate this passage, you will find that how God measures the messenger being received is whether or not that community supports that man or that woman being there. That's how God determines whether or not the message is received, whether or not the messenger is received. It has nothing to do with how many people come to church. It has to do with whether or not the people financially, substantively support that individual so that they can remain in that community to do the work that they are doing. And if the people in that community do not substantively, financially support the man or woman of God, then Jesus said, move on. He said, move on. Go somewhere else. Because ultimately you may burn through a hundred different communities, but finally you're going to find a place where the people are going to love and appreciate you, the message that you preach, and they're going to be willing to support you so that you can remain in that community and do the work that God has given you a vision to do. And so that is how the Word of God declares it is to be done. I know there are a lot of people out there who find fault with this preacher because I even entertain the thought of moving on. I don't do it gleefully. I don't do it joyfully. I would so much rather be able to say that we were able to find 
people in this community who were willing to support us so that we could remain here. But that has not simply been the case. So uh, we're asking God to open doors. Uh, I need a good church. I need to be part of a good church. Every believer needs to be part of a good church. I'm going to tell you, walking victoriously in Christ is not something you can do. I don't care how you try to deceive yourself. It is not something you can do isolated and alone. It cannot be done. When you isolate yourself, you become prey for the enemy. He looks for sheep that have been separated from the rest of the uh, pack. And he looks for those who are injured. He looks for those who are hurting. He looks for those who are wounded. And generally, those are the people who separate themselves from the rest of the sheep. And so, therefore, you become prey for the enemy. And I've never known anybody who separated themselves from the people of God and from the church who lived a victorious Christian life. Never known anybody. I've known hundreds of people who would stand there and tell me, oh, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And they are as full of bitterness and anger and angst as anybody can be. They're doing things they know good and well they ought not to be doing. They're saying things they good and well know they ought not to be saying. But they're justifying themselves in it. When we go to the house of God, we encourage one another. We inspire one another. We help one another to hold the line and to walk this faith that we sing about and that we preach about. And I don't know about anybody else, but I believe the Word of God. And I know that I need a good church. I've told Tommy this probably a thousand times or more. said, I need a good church. I would be more victorious in my walk with God if I had a good church. And I know this. And so therefore, uh, I'm asking the Lord to send us somewhere where we can establish a good church. A church empowered by the Holy Ghost. A church where the Spirit of the Lord can fall like rain. A church where healings and miracles are commonplace. A church where people run for the altar begging to be baptized in Jesus' name. A church where people want to be filled with the Holy Ghost and power. That's the kind of church I need. And that's the kind of church that I have a vision to build. Amen. A church that is welcome, welcoming and inclusive of all God's people wherever they are in their life, whatever their circumstance, whatever their sexual orientation, the color of their skin, their first language, it doesn't matter, land of origin, that's the kind of church I want to be part of. You know, it's funny, I'm going to say this, then I'm going to move on with the service. I was pastoring my third church way back around 19, oh, probably around 87 or 88. As a matter of fact, it was a year or two before I came out. And I uh, was pastoring my third church. It was my first apostolic work and there was a lady from a nearby United Pentecostal church that I adored she was a real precious saint of God she was from the Dominican Republic as a matter of fact and uh, she came one I believe it was on a Tuesday night Bible study because she attended the local UPC and I was not interested in proselyting. I wasn't interested in drawing any people away from that church or any other church. I never have been big on proselytizing. That, that's not ever been big on my priorities. And uh, 
<clears throat> but she knew me and I had attended the church she was a part of. Well, I used to have a radio pro two radio programs while I was part of that church. <clears throat> and uh, so she come out sometime to visit us on the uh, uh, Tuesday night Bible study or Thursday night we had an evangelistic service. They didn't have church on Tuesday or Thursday. They had it on Wednesday. So that gave people an opportunity at least to come support us, you know, and they would, and people from that church would come and support us because they knew me, and you know. Well, anyway, this particular lady came one Tuesday night, and we were walking out onto the uh, outside of the front of the church. We were renting a church building. I've told you the story about this particular building. It was a big, beautiful uh, wood frame church building that held about 300 to 350 people or so. And uh, we were renting this building, and we were coming out as we were going to lock up, and we were going to go get something to eat. And she was sharing with me. She said, I had a dream about you and your church the other day. She said, I saw you pastoring a church with many, many, many people. She said, but the thing that really stuck out to me was that the people were every race and every creed. She said there were Asian, there were people of color, there were people there, Native Americans, she said. It was such a diverse congregation. She said, I've never seen a church that had this kind of diversity. She said, but I had this dream and I saw you pastoring a church with an extremely diverse congregation. Well, as she said that, all of a sudden we heard a voice say, God bless you. Just like that. There were only about five or six of us on the porch of the church. And we all stopped. I mean, literally, we all went dead silent. And we looked at each other. Who said that? None of us said that. Not a one of us. It was a male voice, number one. And the only man on the porch at the time was myself. And I think my baby brother Dallas was with me at the time. And brother Cumby may or may not have been on the porch. But it was none of our three voices. And we just stopped and everybody looked. And all of a sudden, you could feel the presence of the Holy Ghost so powerfully. It was as if an angel of God was pronouncing a blessing on that vision and on that dream that this lady had had. So I'm still believing God that maybe that dream is yet to come to fruition. But that has been my dream as well. Amen. To build a church where God's people truly are one. And where God's people love one another, not in word, but in deed and in truth. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. Continue to remember Tommy and I at this time. Sister Amy uh, is going through a difficult time right now. She's got a situation with her employment uh, that could be very problematic. And we need the Lord to intervene for her. Uh, Brother Brandon uh, it has got an uncle who is in the hospital right now suffering with both COVID and pneumonia. And he desperately needs our prayer. I've been praying for a few days concerning these needs. I also sent out an email asking for folks to remember these needs. But we want to remember them as well today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this afternoon. Father, we love you, God, and we are so grateful once again, Lord, for the opportunity to come together as the people of God. There is no greater pleasure, there is no greater joy in my life than being able to come into the house of God and worship the Lord. Master, today as we come into this place, 
We come in with thanksgiving. We come in with praise. You've done so much for us. If you never did a single thing more, you have done so much for us that we could be grateful for the remainder of our lives just for that which you've done for us to date. But Lord, today we also come in as the people of God. We are the sheep of your pasture. We are the children of your household and we rely upon you as our caregiver. You declare in your word, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And Master, today there are many needs represented within this ministry, within this congregation, those who are spread abroad, who follow and support this ministry. And we lift up today, God, Amy. We ask God that you would intervene in some powerful way in her situation. If it be your will that she remain where she is, then Lord, open the door and allow this to happen. But if it be your will, she move on to some other field, then we ask God that you would make a way and allow this to happen for her uh, swiftly, Lord, and immediately so that she might continue to provide for her family. We lift up Brandon's uncle today, Lord. We ask God that you would touch him in body and mind and in soul. Right now, in the name of Jesus, inspire within him, O oh God, the faith to believe you for a miracle because we know, Lord, we serve a miracle-working God. Heal him, Lord. Touch him. Deliver him at this hour. O oh Master, in the name of Jesus, and lastly, Lord, we ask you to remember us as well. At this hour, you know the need, the Word of God declaring, you know what we have need of before we even ask. But you also tell us by reason of the Word, ye have not because ye ask not. Master, today we're asking that you would continue to intervene on behalf of Tommy concerning work. You know, Lord, what we need in that area. You know what is required. But even more important than this, we ask God that you would place us in some community. I don't care if it's the backwoods of Mississippi. As long as it's a community, God, where the people will respond to this message that we preach. Lord, that people who love God, who love to worship, who love to pray, who love to work for the Lord, not people who want to come in and just sit in the pew and do nothing. They're willing to sing the songs, they're willing to hear the preaching, but they're not willing to put their shoulder to the test. We need people, Lord, with a mind to work for God so that we might accomplish great things in your name. Oh God, this country needs revival. The church in America is misled and misdirected and we need revival more than we've ever needed revival before. And if we be the only congregation in this entire country that is hungry and crying out for the fires of revival, then Lord, let that revival start here. And like any fire, let it spread to our neighboring communities, to our state, our country, and our world. Oh, Master, we ask all this today. Move in this service in a powerful, wonderful way. Touch hearts, encourage, uplift, and inspire. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. We want to worship the Lord this afternoon, and I am going to begin today with a couple of a cappella choruses. I noticed something unusual in watching our Facebook broadcast the other day. Somehow the music was muted, and it sounded like the whole service was a cappella. I don't know how that is possible. I have no clue how that is possible. You could clearly hear uh, us singing here, but you could not hear the music. And, and 
I'm standing up here, and of course the music's blaring in my ear, you know. But somehow, apparently, Facebook has found a way to mute one, you know, aspect of the broadcast and allow the other aspect to come through. So if the service appears to be a cappella all the way through, it is not by our design, okay? So I apologize if you're not able to hear the music on Facebook. Amen. There's an old chorus that says, Jesus is his name. Oh, Jesus is his name. Jesus is his name, my Jesus. Angels prostrate fall and crown him Lord of all. Oh, Jesus is his name. Jesus is his name. Oh, Jesus is his name. Oh, Jesus is his name. My Jesus, angels prostrate fall and crown. Him Lord of all, yes, Jesus is His name. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, here's an old song that reminds us that every day of our Christian walk, we have Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change. In my life, oh, it's Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life! Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life! Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change in my life. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And that's the truth today. Every day, Jesus is on the inside, 
working on the outside, creating change, making us better. Amen. How great is our God. Great and mighty is He. 
Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift your banner, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Hallelujah. Amen. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Amen. Here's an old Fanny Crosby hymn today. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Born of the salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, blessed is love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. My Savior all the day long. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One of my favorite songs today. I'm going that way. I've heard of a land of joy and peace and holy light. A beautiful place of mansions fair, sky so bright. Where all who believe the Savior dear forever shall stay. Having been saved by grace divine, I'm going that way. I'm going that way. Oh, the Savior I adore is with me today. I'll cling to Him and never stray. Singing His praises all day long, I'm going that way. The glorious news I tell and sing as onward I go. Still, astray in sin, my Savior may know. 
Jesus, praise the name of the Lord. I'm going that way. I'm going that way. Praise the name of the Lord today. I want to move directly into the message. I have a lot of material to cover. My little nephew lived with us for a while, Michael Jr., and he said to me one time, he said, Uncle Chuck, you use more scripture when you preach than any preacher I know. He said, the pastor that dad, the church that dad used to take us to, he said, I would sit during his sermon and I'd write down every scripture reference he gave. He said, and usually he'd have maybe three or four. He said, you, literally, by the end of your message, you've given about 12 or 14 or 15 different passages. Well, I like people to know when they hear this preacher preach, that they're hearing the word of the Lord. Amen. And that it is in fact and indeed the word of God rightly divided. Amen. Amen. So I invite you this afternoon to join me. If you'd be so kind. Whoops. Okay, there we go. If you'll join me today in Matthew, the 24th chapter, Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse number 14, Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 14, we're going to read through verse number 25. Matthew 24, 14 through 25. Amen. Matthew 24, verses 14 through 25. And the King James text today reads, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. If 
for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Amen. Matthew 24, 14 through 25. Let's go to the Lord right now with another word of prayer. Master, once again, God, we come before you. The word of the Lord is broken for the benefit of God's people. The bread of life is disseminated. Master, you've called men and women to preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. And Lord, you have placed within our hands the great and awesome responsibility of declaring unto the people of God, Thus saith the Lord. I pray, God, right now, by the anointing and presence and power of the Holy Ghost, that you would touch the lips of your servant, that you would help me to deliver faithfully, adequately, efficiently the Word of God, that the people of God might benefit from it. Lord, today we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our world. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost in the church like we've never needed it before. Touch me, O oh God. Help me to deliver this message in a manner that will be effective. A manner, O oh God, that will bring change into the thinking and into the lives of God's people that we might be ready when this hour of great trouble comes upon us. We ask it all today, O oh God, and none other than in the mighty, powerful, wonderful, saving name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've titled my message today, Be Not Deceived. Amen. Be Not Deceived. The Lord declares that in our primary text today, the Lord declares that things will transpire in the last days which will be so convincing, including supernatural powers and events. He said these things will be so convincing that even the very elect, now the elect, when the term elect is used, this generally refers to the nation and the people of Israel. When you see biblical writers refer to the elect, they're generally speaking to the nation and the people of Israel. 
the closer we come to the end of this age, the more aggressively the enemy of humankind will fight to lay claim on as many souls as he possibly can. There is an important principle that we often overlook, and that principle is this. The closer we come to the outpouring of blessing, the more the enemy is going to fight to prevent us from being in a position to receive that blessing. Did you hear what I just said now? The closer we come to the outpouring of a blessing, meaning the closer we come to God having a blessing scheduled for us, the more the enemy is going to fight to prevent us from being in a position to receive that blessing. In other words, he wants to knock us off track. If he can knock us off track, then we're no longer in a position to receive the blessing. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are people who backslide and they give up on God and they give up on the church and they give up on living for the Lord minutes or hours or days before a blessing has been scheduled to arrive to them. But the enemy knows all I have to do is knock them off track. If I can knock them off track, then they will no longer be in a position to receive that blessing. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He cannot, listen to me, the enemy cannot prevent you from receiving that blessing. But he can cause you to be knocked off track so that you're not in a position any longer to receive it. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? See, a lot of people want to say, oh, this blessing hasn't come because the enemy is in the way. No, 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 honey. When it comes to God's people and the blessing and favor of God, I got news for you. There isn't a devil in hell powerful enough to get in the way. But it's imperative that we stay on track. Hallelujah. It is imperative that we continue to walk as we know we ought to walk so that we might continue to be in a place to receive that blessing when it comes. The principle that I speak of today is often stated as when the Lord starts blessing, the devil comes a messing. Amen. But the truth is, the devil comes a messing before the blessing arrives in an effort to prevent us from receiving it to begin with. As Moses drew closer to the promised land, his patience with God's people grew thin. And he wound up disobeying the voice of the Lord out of sheer frustration. And that disobedience cost him the ability to cross into the promised land with those he had been leading for 40 years. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The enemy was able to knock him off track. Hallelujah. And because he got knocked off track, he no longer was in a position to receive the blessing that for 40 years he looked forward to. The Word of God tells us in John chapter 10 and verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I've often experienced in my own life the concept just about the time I completely run out of patience and start screaming and hollering in frustration, the Lord comes through in miraculous fashion, and I stand there feeling the fool. Amen. <laughs> oh, I can't count how many times I've been in that position. Had I held out just one more day, I would have seen all would end well. 
But in my humanity, I could not find the patience or the peace to hold out for yet one more day. And I found myself breaking just as the blessing was at my door. My goodness, I want to tell you folks, the closer we come to the rapture of the church, the harder the enemy is going to work to see to it that you miss the rapture. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? The harder the enemy is going to work against the church to see to it that backsliders do not get reclaimed. The harder the enemy is going to work against missionaries to make certain that people around the world never hear this wonderful name Jesus. The harder the enemy is going to work to make certain that people in America hate the church and hate the gospel because of the stupidity and the asininity of those who call themselves Christians. You hear what I'm telling you now? This is all how the enemy works. He knows knows that the rapture is coming. He knows the church will soon be redeemed. He does not know the date or the hour. There's a reason Jesus said no man knoweth the date or the hour. The Bible speaks of Satan and says that he is so wise and so cunning that there is nothing that can be hid from him. You wonder why Jesus used the language why he said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour, neither the angels in heaven. He said, not even the Son of Man, meaning his humanity, in his humanity. He said, one of the things I left in heaven, when I left heaven, was the knowledge of the day and the hour that I would come, because that day was already set. He said, I left that knowledge in heaven. Because the devil has no access to it there. But the minute I put it in a human mind, guess what? He has access to it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? There is nothing that can be hid from him. Do you hear what I'm telling you? So the enemy, unlike the church, the enemy knows not only how to read the Bible, but he knows how to understand it. I'm going to tell you something. There are people out there today in evangelical and fundamentalist churches being led by a bunch of false prophets and false teachers. And the enemy laughs because while they are preaching a message that is completely contrary to the Word of God, Satan knows good and well what the Word of God really says. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something. The devil's a lot more panicked today about the return of Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church he is much more panicked about this promise of God than the church is why? because he knows how soon it is to come he knows how much time he has left my goodness all the things that he has in store for the last days for the final push he knows how many of the players are already in place including the Antichrist he knows how exactly where the Antichrist is living right now exactly how old he is exactly how much he knows do you hear what I'm telling you now you see so therefore he is pushing against the church like he has never pushed against the church before. Because if he can knock the people of God off track, if he can knock the church off track, then he will put us in a position to not even be able to receive the promise of God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? We will not be in a position to receive the promised blessing. We will not be able to receive what God has in store for us. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. And oh, wouldn't it be a shame to miss all that because you allowed the enemy at this hour to knock you off track. Oh, I want to tell you, 
it saddens me to see the level of deception that is going on in the church world today. God's people are being deceived in mass. They are being deceived by the millions. This is not a small problem. It is a massive problem. This is not something that is affecting the minority. It is something that in fact is affecting the majority. In the Word of God, Matthew 24 and verse 5, I read it again, I read it to you today. The Lord Jesus Christ said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Mark 13, 6, the same morning. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many. Luke 21 verse 8, and he said, take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Oh, children, I want to tell you today. We are living in an hour and in a time of deception. The enemy is deceiving millions and millions of believers and we had better be in a place today where we are not willing to be deceived. I have over my head today two book covers pictured that I found on the internet. I've, I've seen things posted in recent times concerning these books. One book that is titled President Donald J. Trump, The Son of Man, The Christ. My Lord have mercy. And then another man has written a book, God's Chaos Code. Folks, I've got news for you. God does not work in or through chaos. The word of the Lord declares God is not the author of confusion. That's right. God doesn't work in chaos. God is a God of order and structure. He does not work through chaos. But this is the kind of message that is being sold to the church that Donald J. Trump, one of the most ungodly, wicked, evil, demonic men in human history is indeed the Christ. And there are millions upon millions of Christians who are today believing this foolishness. Oh, children, I want to tell you, I don't know why this thing keeps changing on me. The panel just keeps changing on its own, and I'm not changing it. So I don't know why it keeps changing, but... All right. Amen. Interestingly enough, listen to me, children. The spirit of Antichrist is not identified by permissiveness or the preaching of the acceptability of compromised conduct. That's not how the spirit of Antichrist is identified. The spirit of Antichrist is identified, rather, by the acknowledgement of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this truth which will separate the sheep from the goats. And many in the church today have been so distracted by the false leaders and false teachers of this age that they are focused entirely on the wrong issues and have left themselves wide open to be deceived in areas that really count and that really matter.
in 1 John 4, 1 through 8, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby we know ye know, excuse me, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we, excuse me, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Listen, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The one thing we see happening in the church world today is the glaring absence of love. More hatred and malice is being broadcast from pulpits today than has ever been broadcast from pulpits before. Whereas at one time groups that embraced and preached a hateful, condemnatory, loveless message were viewed as the outliers and objectionable, they now have become the majority of evangelical and fundamentalist Christianity. People and certain groups within our population today are preached against and identified as the enemies of society, the enemies of the church, the enemies of our government, and preachers no longer admonish believers to live as the Lord has called us to live and to walk in love toward those who are both in and outside of the church. In Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 12, the word of the Lord declares, Be ye followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye therefore... Partake, be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. 
approving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Today the church will embrace and defend men who are wicked to the core and who have a reputation for openly embracing a lifestyle that is not at all reflective of faith in God and a walk with Jesus Christ. This is contrary to the instruction we have received from the Word of God. We are to be more discerning than this, not being deceived by false claims of faith, while the actions of the individual make abundantly clear that they, can, that they possess no real confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 5, 43 through 48, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the public and soul? Be ye therefore perfect, meaning mature, grown, established, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, as well as verse 13. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly laden uh, women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then in verse 13, the, uh, the writer says, Paul said to Timothy, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? This is for those who want to believe universalist theology. You see, there are people out there today who want to tell you that in the end, everybody's going to be saved. There is no distinction. There's no such thing as being born again. There's no such thing as being numbered among the redeemed. There is no such thing as being numbered among the righteous. In the end, all of humanity will be saved. But the writer today answers this false doctrine in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, 
nor adulterers, nor effeminate, and I'm going to address that in a moment, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Folks, since the beginning of time, there have been many non-believers who would gladly attend church. But this does not mean that they embrace the faith. There are a lot of wicked men who go to church. One of the rules, anybody who knows anything about organized crime, and the Italian mafia in particular, knows that according to mafia rules, you had to go to Mass. If you were a made man, if you were part of the mafioso, you had to attend church. That was required. Every great organized criminal leader in our country was known to go to church. Al Capone was the churchgoer. Every great mafioso figure has always gone to church. John Gotti was a churchgoer. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But this is where Paul said, we got to be careful because too many people want to believe that just because they come to church that they're going to be saved. No, he said, the unrighteous have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. It's not about simply coming to church and all of a sudden you're saved because you come to church. He said, no, there is a distinction between those who will be saved and those who will not. I want to point out because so many in the LGBT community find themselves condemned when they read the word effeminate in the King James translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to help you understand something real quick because this is an area where so many misunderstand and they wind up experiencing great uh, difficulty because of this word that we read in the King James text. <coughs> the word that is translated effeminate in the King James <coughs> excuse me, comes from the original Greek, a word which simply translates as soft. So literally, the literal translation of this word would be soft. The problem is the translators of the King James interpreted the concept of one's being soft as being effeminate. Now, I have preached for decades that it is imperative when we study the Word of God that we understand Scripture answers Scripture. You do not simply use your own logic and your own reasoning to determine what this means over here. You know, you don't just apply human reasoning and expect to come up with divine understanding. It doesn't work that way. The truth of the matter is the term soft, as we read it in this passage, is the same word soft that we read when it is speaking of the rich and the well-to-do. Jesus said, when you go out to see John the Baptist, what are you going out to see? A man in soft raiment? He said, no. You're going to, you know, here's a guy who wears camel's hair. Here's a guy who's wearing anything but soft raiment. You see, the truth of the matter is, the term soft here, in my estimation, has more to do with the rich, those who live soft, easy lives. 
Did not Jesus say it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Yes, he did. So that would actually make sense, wouldn't it? But then also there are others who have pointed out that the term soft, as Paul used it, could easily have been speaking as well of those who were weak, those who could not hold their faith strong in the face of a great persecution and great difficulty. Because in the first century, the church experienced a great deal of persecution. And many people proved themselves to be soft. They couldn't stand up to the persecution. They couldn't stand up to uh, the ridicule. And therefore, they would surrender and yield their faith. So no matter how you look at it, the truth of the matter is, this passage could well be speaking of those who are uh, soft. They can't stand up to the trials and tribulations of living for the Lord. It also can speak to those who are rich and well-to-do, whom the Bible has told us will have a harder time getting into the kingdom of heaven than a camel getting through the eye of a needle. That makes sense, doesn't it? Amen. You see, we got to be careful, folks. I just preached the other day. It's not as easy as black and white. You've got to do a little research. You've got to study to show yourself approved unto God. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 11 of unregenerate sinners joining themselves to the body of Christ without being in possession of true faith in the resurrected Lord. We've had politicians in the last five years running around trying to identify themselves as part of the church and yet they are as ungodly and as wicked in lifestyle and it is a well-known fact they are. They're on their third marriages. They've got babies with women all over the place. They have been involved with prostitutes while their wife was married and while their wife was pregnant. And yet, somehow, we have Christian leaders who have the gall to get up and tell God's people, yes, this man is a Christian. Yes, this man follower of Christ. It doesn't matter that everything in his life testifies to this not being true. Oh, don't be deceived, children. Don't be deceived because if you can believe Donald Trump's a Christian, then you can believe you can be a Christian and do all the same things he does. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Do not be deceived, my friend. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, the author writes, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, meaning to government and authorities, to obey magistrates, that means law enforcement, to abide by the law, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, Oh, what? So it isn't within the Christian purview to claim that Democrats are sacrificing children to the devil in the basement of pizza parlors somewhere. I'm sorry, that's not the way my Bible reads. My Bible said to speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, meaning not to be argumentative and debative, but gentle. Showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, meaning desires and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, 
But according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration, baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, baptism with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Acts 2.38, my friend, is being mirrored in this passage. Which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Isn't it funny that in the same passage, Titus says God our Savior and Jesus Christ our Savior in the same identical passage. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. O oh, children, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. We're getting closer to the end of this age. And the enemy is pulling out all the stops to deceive as many of God's people as he possibly can. And you know what? It's working. We're not seeing the move of God in Pentecostal churches like we did just even 30 years ago, 40 years ago, never mind 100 years ago. We're not seeing the move of God. We're not seeing things happen in spirit-filled churches like we used to see. Why? Because the enemy has got the church distracted. He's got the church fighting culture wars. He's got the church fighting political wars. Instead of being focused on spiritual things and living as the Word of God has called us to live, being the testimony and the witness before a lost and dying world that God has called us to be. Don't be deceived if you live like the world, if you've got as much hate in you and anger in you and malice in you as they do, then folks, you're going to experience the same end they experience. Mm -hmm. Don't deceive yourself. Don't kid yourself. The church today looks more like the world than the church has ever looked. Cracks me up when I see these idiot politicians getting on television or on the radio and saying, Oh, the church is supposed to inform the government how to do things, not vice versa. Baloney. The church is not supposed to be married to the government in any way, shape, size, or form. The church's mission is spiritual. The government's mission is natural and carnal. It is not the church's business to dominate or control any organization or structure in this life. And saying so is deception. You are fooling the people of God. And the thing that makes me laugh is, where is the distinction between the church and the world? Mm -hmm. I don't see it. The church is as angry. Why are so many people following after politicians like Donald J. Trump? Oh, because he expresses the anger that we feel. He's angry and he expresses our anger. Oh, really? So what you're telling me then is the church is as angry as the world is. Hello now. The church is as hateful as the world is. The church is as spiteful as the world is. The church is looking for... Revenge just as quickly as the world is looking for revenge, if I tell the truth. Lastly, today in Romans 2, 1 through 10, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest, listen, doest the same things. It's always amazed me how a secular homophobia looks absolutely no different than religious homophobia. 
No, homophobia is homophobia. It don't matter whether it's in the church or out of the church. It looks the same in either place. The only difference is the church tries to quote scripture to justify it. But they use all the same arguments. But listen, Paul said in Romans chapter 2, he said, you're, while you're judging somebody else, he said, all you're doing is bringing condemnation down on yourself because you're doing the same identical things they're doing. You accuse them of being hateful, you're being hateful. You accuse them of being malicious, and you're being malicious. You, can, you accuse them of trying to control the world, and you're trying to control the world. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I, I've been doing affirming ministry now for 30 years. I'm literally a few months away from celebrating 30 years of ministry, trying to reach out with a restorative mes message to all people who have lost uh, faith in the church and who have been separated and ostracized from the church but especially those who are part of the LGBT community who have been pushed aside and, and mistreated and abused. And believe me, I've been there, so I know what I'm talking about. I know this goes on. But I've been 30 years now trying to minister a message of restoration and reconciliation and healing to people who feel as though the church has failed them, who feel as though God's people have failed them. And they have. But I'm here to tell you now, folks, we cannot afford to be deceived. You can't afford to lose out on eternal life and the blessing of God and the favor of God on your life in the here and now, all because people who aren't going to make heaven anyway, people who, who God does not see as being part of His family, people who act one way and profess something different, you, you don't understand, according to the Word of God, the authors of the New Testament epistles have made it clear that just because you come into the church doesn't mean you're one part of the church. You know, I've said before, and I'll say it again, I get so tired of people telling me, I can be a Christian, I don't have to go to church. You know what? I'd go find me a little church somewhere that had ten people in it that I could worship with, that I could 
benefit from the preached word of God with. If, if I had to search every church in town, I'd find me one that I could fellowship with. Because we need one another, especially the Word of God said, as we see the day approaching. Children, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. When you see people out there sowing malice and angst and anger, when you see them sowing all these negative things, you better know that they're not going to somehow prove God a liar. They're not somehow going to reap good from all that bad seed. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. But the truth is, the same laws that apply to them apply to you and I. You know, Tommy, I've been preaching this message for 30 years and I feel more confident in the message you hear preached from this church than I do the message I hear preached from 90% of television preachers. I don't get up here and preach against this group and that group. I don't get up here and preach against those people and those people. No. In this church, we instruct people to live good, don't we? Mm -hmm. To do good. Mm -hmm. We talk about good works and good deeds being the earmark of living for God. We talk about righteousness and doing right. And at the very least, striving to do right, don't we? Mm -hmm. You don't hear that preached anymore from church pulpits. You don't hear preachers preaching God's people into right living. You don't hear preachers preaching God's people into doing good. You don't hear preachers preaching love your neighbor, love your enemy, do good to them that spitefully use you. That very passage that I read today, I have read probably in the last six months, I've read that passage at least five or six times in the course of my message, haven't I? Mm -hmm. When's the last time you heard that passage preached? By Franklin Graham. When's the last time you heard that passage preached by Pat Robertson? When's the last time you heard that passage preached by all these television preachers who brag that they're doing the will and work of God? No, 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 children. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Oh, I'm here to tell you, the enemy's pushing hard because blessing is coming our way. The enemy wants to... You know, I, I'm going to close with this. I was, trying, I was trying not to, to be honest with you, but I'm going to close with it because it's a good example. We have neighbors. Never in the history of my life have I ever not gotten along Famously with my neighbors. I've always gotten along very well with my neighbors for the most part. I, I've never had trouble with neighbors. If they need help, I'm there to help them. If, if they need something, I'm happy to lend it to them. Or if they need their, their lawn mowed, I'm happy to mow it for them. We had one little neighbor across the street from us here. He since has passed on, bless his heart. He was a little old Baptist man. And he, his lawn would grow up real tall and everything because he couldn't get out and mow it. And I, I guess he couldn't afford to hire anybody to mow it either. So when I would go out to mow our lawn, I would use, I used a riding tractor mower, you know. And after I was done with our lawn, I'd go down the road a little bit, go down and come up the other side because that's the only way I could go down off the sidewalk, you know. I'd come up the other side, I'd mow his front lawn for him. And uh, he was so grateful and he was so pleased that he told me, he said, you know, he said, you are living Christianity the way Christianity is supposed to be lived. That's what he told me one time. And he said, and I'm so grateful, he said, I can't even tell you how grateful I am. And you know, I didn't mind doing it for him, did I, Booby? No. One time, we hadn't lived here very long, I noticed that my neighbor next door, their lawn was kind of high, 
And here in Texas, and Dallas especially, we have these people that drive around code enforcement, and they'll give you a ticket if your lawn is high and stuff, you know. So like a fool, I decided I was going to try to be nice to my neighbor, and I mowed my lawn, and then I went ahead and mowed their front lawn for them too. Now I did it not as an insult to them. I wasn't trying to say, y'all don't take care of your lawn, so I'll take care of it for you. No, I did it thinking I knew this was an older couple, and I told Tommy, I said, normally the old man's out there mowing his lawn regularly and everything. I said, maybe he's sick or something, so I'm going to do it as a way of trying to help them a little bit, you know? Well, we hadn't lived here very, very long. I mean, maybe a month or two when I did that. And next thing you know, every time I see one of those people, the neighbors, the couple, the man or the woman, every time I see one of them starting to walk over toward me, I'd be mowing the lawn and one of them start coming toward me on my tractor. And they walk right into our property, you know, and come to me on my tractor. And I knew after a while I learned that the minute I saw them coming to me, they were going to start griping and groaning and throwing a hissy fit over something. Because this is what they proved to do. Every single time, without exception. They never came over to just shoot the breeze, you know. That old fellow that used to live kind of across ways from us across the street, bless his heart, he'd see me out there morning and he'd come over and he'd start talking to me. But he'd be talking about the weather and talking about this and that. And, and I couldn't get him a lawn mode because he was a talker. He'd just talk and talk and talk. But he didn't come over to complain. He'd just come over to shoot the breeze, you know. Well, these people, they don't shoot the breeze. The only, only reason they ever, ever walked over in my direction was to complain about something. And they would complain about the most foolish, idiotic stuff you ever heard in your life. The old lady, well, you mowed three inches into our property line. The property line is right here. Do you see this crack between these sidewalk panels here well that's the property line right there so I would try my best to mow up to that line well of course folks I don't care how perfect you are you're never going to be able to do exactly you know on a certain line and she'd come griping because I went one inch over her literally this is how ridiculous it got I spent thousands of dollars literally Putting in flower beds that were no maintenance on the side of the house facing their property, right along the front of the house, right along their property line, I put a flower bed, went all the way down to the road almost. And that way, I never have to worry about whether or not I mow up to their property line. Do you know those people will mow within an inch of that border that I put for this flower bed and then they'll sit there and wait for us to come trim the other inch on the other side facing their property this is how ridiculous they are about the property line and yet this last week they were cutting branches overhanging their carport that belongs to a tree in our yard that is right up against the fence. Now, by law, if a tree is overhanging your property, you, by law, can trim those branches. I don't have a problem with them trimming the branches. Couldn't care less. But then they have the gall to bring all the trimmings that they've trimmed and lay them out in front of our house for the big trash collector people to come collect. Now why would they do this? If they put them in front of their house, they're going to get picked up just as quick as they're going to get picked up if they're in front of our house. The only problem is Tommy and I, at the moment, park our cars out in front of the house on the road. So with all them tree branches, there, we have to move our cars way up forward so the trash people can reach these limbs to pick them up and stuff. 
here are people who are so worried about the property line that they want to gr gripe and groan every chance they get, but they don't think nothing of intruding upon that property line when it suits them. They don't think they don't think anything of letting their dog wander the neighborhood and come over into our yard and poop. Our dogs go in the backyard. They never go in the front yard. If we take our dogs out the front door, they are on a leash, which is the law here in Texas. They okay, Pastor, why are you saying all this? I'm trying to paint a picture for you. I'm trying to help you understand something. I got so aggravated with these people this week because Tommy went out to the car. And we had taken the branches they left and we moved them over to their side of the property line. And that was so that we could park our cars where we park our cars without having to, you know, park halfway into the next state. <laughs> and, you know, so, the, so that the people can pick them up. Well, I was in the backyard, Tommy's in the front yard, and this old lady comes to Tommy and she starts griping and groaning about how well, those are branches from our tree, from your tree, and that's why we're going to put them over there. And, blah, blah. and then she had the gall to tell Tommy the real reason they were pulling this little stunt. If you have too much big trash, the city of Dallas will charge you for collecting that trash that they pick up. So she said to Tommy, and you're going to get a bill for all them uh, tree branches and brush and blah 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 because it was your tree that we cut it down well I don't know what she thinks I'm going to do whether I'm going to cut the tree down from my yard just to make her happy or whether I have magic powers and somehow or another I can say tree poof do not grow any longer over into their side of you know of uh, the property line I don't know what she thinks I can do well I got quite aggravated with her foolishness and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and the Spirit of the Lord said, Be careful. Be careful. The enemy uses these kind of circumstances so he can push you off track, so you'll do something stupid, so you'll do something you shouldn't have done, and then you no longer are lined up for a blessing. So be careful. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And the Lord reminded me of this, Tommy, and I said, okay, Lord, I get it. So I've got to, I've got to measure my response. I've got to be careful not to overreact, not to get foolish about this. Do you follow what I'm telling you, saints? I'm going to tell you, folks, don't be deceived. God wants His people to act like His people regardless of of what's going on in our world, regardless of what's going on in our culture, regardless of what's going on in our government. Am I telling the truth today? Be not deceived. Amen. If you'll stand with me this afternoon, I want us to end the service. We're going to sing a song of consecration this evening, or this afternoon, I should say. I love this old song. It says, Search me, O God. And know my thoughts, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this as unto the Lord this afternoon. Search me, O God, and know my heart today.
here to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it holy thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. We are in the greatest hour of deception the church will ever know. The Lord warned us of it. The apostles warned us of it. And we're experiencing it. We're seeing it. But we are admonished today by the Word of God over and over again. The passages I read to you today admonished us over and over again. We better live this thing. Mm -hmm. Be not deceived. We better keep our eyes open. Be not deceived. We better be discerning. Be not deceived. We better not ex accept everybody who comes to church as being part of the family of God. Be not deceived. Hello now. And don't live like the world and expect to make heaven. Be not deceived. Hallelujah. Father, we love you, Lord, today, and we thank you for the opportunity once again to have been in the house of God. We thank you for the word of the Lord, which encourages us, admonishes us to live this life that we might be a light in a dark world. Help us, Lord, today. So many things have come upon God's people. We're frustrated, we're upset, we're under a great deal of stress. It's so easy today, Lord, for us to act out and to do things in ways that we ought not to do them. But Lord, our heart's desire today is to live as a child of God ought to live. Help us, Lord, today to love those that uh, are considered our enemies today. Lord, that we might fulfill the Word of God, that we might be the children of God. Master, today, help us to walk in discernment that we might not be deceived. Help us to discern the false prophet from that one who truly, genuinely represents the Word of God. Help us to distinguish and to discern between false brethren and those, Lord, who genuinely, truly are striving to live this life. Master, in the name of Jesus, open our eyes. Cause us to be sober and awake in this dark hour of deception. As the greatest blessing that God's people will ever know, the rapture of the church, comes near upon us. Help us, Lord, to be alert, watching, waiting, ready at any moment, O oh God, that we might be partakers of the great escape. And Lord, we will not see nor experience the most difficult times that are to come in the course of the great tribulation. Master, we love you and we thank you, God, for standing with the nation of Ukraine. Oh God, what a marvelous thing it has been to see so small a nation. And yet, oh God, you've opened the door to allow them to get the support they need. You've given them divine wisdom and knowledge. You've given them, Lord, direction so that they might fight for their own freedom. And we pray, oh God, today that you would continue to intervene on behalf of the Ukraine today. Master, allow them to be uh, a people who determine their own governance 
even as we as a nation are able to determine our own. We love you today, O oh God. You're a wonderful God. We thank you, Lord, for answered prayer, even the answers we've not yet seen. But we know today, O oh God, the answer's on the way. Master, bless us. Keep us in your care. Keep your hand upon your people, God, as they're still viruses running through the air, sickness, disease, turmoil, and trouble in the world in which we live. Keep us under your watchful care. Oh, Lord, we ask it all today and none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I appreciate your coming to be with us this afternoon. I hope this service has been a blessing and an encouragement to you. I also hope you'll come see us again next Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time for a time of worship and the Word. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.